so the other day, my neighbor told me that he thinks that his dog has some joint problems. And he thinks that the diagnosis is arf, 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 arthritis, arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings and salutations, everybody. It's Ryan here. We're chatting about rheumatic fever today. So this is the outline. We're going to be discussing a clinical case, then delving into rheumatic fever, talking about the pathogenesis, the clinical presentation, how to diagnose, treat, and of course, mention prophylaxis. And of course, we're going to encourage from scripture as well. All right, are you ready? Time to fasten your seatbelts because here we go. Um, a 19-year-old presents to your office for routine screening, physical examination. From the age of four years, she was diagnosed with acute rheumatic fever. She does not recall the specifics of her illness and remembers only that she was required to be on bed rest for six months. That's a long time. She has remained on penicillin V orally at a dose of 250 milligram twice daily since that time. She asks if she can safely discontinue this medication. Hmm. She has had only one other flare for disease since the age of eight when she had stopped taking penicillin. She is currently employed as a daycare provider. Her physical examination is notable for normal apex and a grade 3 out of 6 pan-systolic murmur. Best heard at the apex of the heart and radiates up to the axilla. What do you advise the patient to do? Right. Are you going to say A, an echo should be performed to determine the extent of the valvular damage before deciding if penicillin can be discontinued? Is it B, penicillin prophylaxis can be discontinued because she has had no flares in the last five years? Is it C, she could change her dosage regimen to intramuscular benzathine penicillin every eight weeks? Is it D, she could continue on penicillin indefinitely as she had a previous occurrence? have presumed rheumatic heart disease and is working in the field with high occupational exposure to group A strep, or is it E, she should replace penicillin prophylaxis with polyvalent um, pneumococcal vaccine every five years? Well, mm, I wonder. Okay, everybody, let's start talking. What is rheumatic fever and outline the pathogenesis of this condition? Well, Rheumatic fever is a multi-systemic disorder. It simply occurs as a sequelae to pharyngitis by our beloved beta hemolytic streptococci Lansfield group A. Beta hemolytic strep group A. It is due to molecular mimicry. There's an autoimmune reaction between the antigen, which is termed the M protein of the organism, and cardiac myosin and sarcolemma membrane protein, which is laminin. So there's a cross reaction between uh, so the antibodies that produced against the M-protein antigen, but the innocent bystander that gets chucked out is laminin, right? As a result, antibodies produced against the cyprococcal enzyme mediating inflammation in the pericardium and myocardium as well as joints and skin. So the maximum we use here is that rheumatic fever licks the joints but bites the heart. <laughs> Okay, this is molecular mimicry. So essentially what happens, okay, this is a picture taken from www.stepwoods.com. Thank you so much. So you get a strep throat infection. The immune system is activated. This is a beautiful lymph node, right? Let's just get my point in there. Beautiful lymph node activated here. B lymphocytes are primed. Antiseptococcal antibodies are produced, liberated into the bloodstream. But molecular mimicry happens, and there's a cross-reaction of these antibodies. They try to target the beta hemolytic uh, cryptococcal organisms, the M protein, but they mistake some of the body's tissues for being that M protein. And we said it's sarcolimal uh, laminin protein. So as a result, you end up with vegetations in the heart, with myocardial ash off bodies, and with fibrinous pericarditis on the back of deposition of this cross reactive antibody. That's molecular mimicry. What's a differential diagnosis for rheumatic fever? So there's quite a few things to mention. There's reactive arthritis, colitis syndrome, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, seronegative arthritis, now we have ankylosing spondylitis or enteropathic arthritis, hemophilic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, but the tip-off day is that you have concomitant skin and nail changes, septic arthritis, acute luke, acute gouty arthritis and trauma. All of these form a differential for the uh, clinical presentation of rheumatic fever. So here is a beautiful diagram. This is the anatomy of the heart. And we can see it is indeed the left atrium and left ventricle opened. Now, rheumatic fever has a predilection for certain valves, mitral valve most commonly, right? Mitral valve 
in about 90% of cases, all right? And this is just showing us the left mitral valve open. We can see the bilateral cord tendine here. Um, and of course, this is just a different section through it showing us the same thing. The second most common valve involved is the aortic valve. But mitral valve is involved far more commonly than the aortic valve. And it's very rare that you see the tricuspid and the pulmonary valve being involved in rheumatic fever. Okay, and this is just showing us the sequelae of rheumatic fever involving the, the, the mitral valve. It becomes thickened and stenotic, all right? Um, and that's just demonstrated here in this beautiful diagram from Netta. So what are the presenting complaints in a patient with rheumatic fever? So it usually occurs in kids and young adults, and the features are what we call a migrating, right? so-called fleeting, non-deforming polyarthritis affecting the large joint. So there's some key words there, some key descriptions we need to take cognizance of. It's migrating, it's non-deformative, and it involves the large joints, the knee, the ankle, and the elbows, and the wrists with fever. It may be continuous, high-grade fever, and that's presenting feature in about 75% of cases. Patients may also complain of palpitations and chest pain due to the carditis in about half of the cases. A rash, that being erythema marginatum, we'll talk more about that subcutaneous nodules, involuntary movements, which speaks to chorea, and about 10 to 30% of cases, malaise, weakness, and fatigue. So in terms of examining a patient with suspected rheumatic fever, this is the suggested approach by Tally. First, you would examine the large joints of the limbs for effusions and synovitis, right? That speaks to the migrating, flitting polyarthritis. By definition, two or more joints must be involved. Classically, it's transient and migratory, right? You want to feel for subcutaneous nodules over the bony prominences. You look for a rash, which speaks to erythema marginatum, which is an evanescent rash, right? Not evanescent, the rock group, my immortal and all that. <laughs> this is an evanescent rash, which is raised pink or red that blanches the pressure, affectionately termed erythema marginatum. The red rings have a clear center and round margins and occur on the trunk and proximal limbs. The rash is not found on the face. It's not found in the face. So don't mistake, if there's something on the face, it's probably not in the imaginatum. It's probably rosacea or even butterfly rash of lupus or something else. Look for choreiform movements, which speaks to certain names, chorea. They are sinuous, dance-like movements. <laughs> Their onset is usually delayed until about three months after throat infection. Now you examine the cardiovascular system for any signs of pan, 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 not pots. <laughs> Carditis, which is a pericardial rub, which is a scratching, leathery sound, right? Which is independent of respiration. If it depends on respiration, it's most likely a plural rub, and that's the way you differentiate them. Ask the patient to hold their breath. If that sound still persists, the grating, leathery sound is most likely pericardial rub. You examine for congestive heart failure due to myocarditis and a mitral aortic regurgitation due to acute endocarditis. Finally, take the temperature. What is an Ashkoff or Ashoff nodule? It is a granulomatous nodule composed of central, the word is fibrinoid necrosis, right? Fibrinoid necrosis, right? That's the pathological term. And multinucleated giant cells surrounded by macrophages and T lymphocytes that occur throughout the heart. So that we talk about pancarditis. It's pathognomonic for rheumatic fever. And this is what looks like, histologically speaking, a rheumatic granuloma. And it's composed of, uh, like we said, this is the Ashoff cell we have here. This is the plasma cells and lymphocytes. Um, essentially, that's the rheumatic granuloma. So which joints are commonly involved in acute rheumatic fever? It's the large joints, everybody. The large joints. Doesn't affect the small joints. As an RA, here we're talking about large joints. So the ankle, the wrist, the knee, the elbow, usually does not involve small joints of the hands and feet, and very rarely does it uh, involve the hip joint. What's the diagnostic criteria for rheumatic fever? So here we're keeping up with the Jones. We're keeping up with the Jones. Modified Jones criteria, everybody. Right. Following an attack of streptococcus pharyngitis, there is usually a latent period of one to three weeks. Right. And uh, diagnosis is made by having two major or having one major and two minor criteria plus supportive evidence of step infection. We're going to cover this twice, okay? So a handy way to remember the major criteria is the mnemonic Jones, right? So J speaks to, okay, let's just move this out of the way uh, and get my pointer in there. Alrighty, J speaks to joints. So we're talking about shifting or migratory polyarthritis involving the big joints. That's the knee, elbow, ankle, wrist. Knee, elbow, ankle, wrist. Knee, ankle, elbows, and wrist. Okay, then the obvious one is carditis. 
So pancarditis, endocardial involvement, myocardial involvement, pericardial involvement. N is for nodules, subcutaneous nodules. E is erythema marginatum. It's evanescent. It comes and goes. And S is Sydenham's chorea. There you are. So you get, you need the, for, for, if in terms of the major criteria, you need four. I beg your pardon, two. Or it's one major and two minor, okay? Plus evidence of recent strep infection. The minor criteria, you can remember, by the mnemonic CAFE, pal. Let's go have some coffee. <laughs> Fancy a spot of coffee, old chap. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, by the way, why did the, the coffee go to the police station? Because it got mugged. <laughs> <laughs> so C speaks to the CRP being high. A is arthralgia, not arthritis. This is arthralgia. F is fever. E is speaks to the ESR being high, erythrocyte sedimentation rate being high. P is PR prolongation on the ECG, which speaks to first or second degree heart block. A is anamnesis of rheumatism, which simply means a history of previous joint involvement. And L is leukocytosis, already. And of course, the third thing is we need evidence of recent strep infection. We need some good evidence in the court of law. Uh, what stands as evidence in the court of law is positive throat culture for group A strep, a clinical history of scarlet fever, and a raised anti and O titer or other streptococcal antibody titer being anti-DNAs or anti-hyaluronidase. Okay, this is a fun cartoon from medcomic.com. Thank you so much, Mr. George Muniz and company. So, illustrating the Jones criteria, we're keeping up with the Jones. We need two major uh, or one major, two minor with evidence of recent strep uh, infection, right? And here we speak to Jones. J is what we covered already being flitting, migratory, polyarthritis, uh, that's a J. O is obvious being pancarditis. N is nodules. E is erythema marginatum. S the nymph's chorea. The minor criteria is being arthralgia, prolonged PR interval fever, elevated ESR, CRP. This is another way to represent the same thing. Once again, just going over our mnemonic. Uh, so the major criteria being J for joint involvement. O is obvious. Looks like a heart or myocarditis. Together with pan, it's pancarditis essentially. N is nodules, being subcutaneous nodules. E is erythema marginatum. S the nymph's chorea. Minor criteria being cafe pal. CRP is up. C, A is arthralgia. F being fever. E is elevated ESR. PAL being prolonged PR interval. A, anamnesis of rheumatism. L is leukocytosis. To make the diagnosis, we need two major criteria. Or you need one major with two minor criteria. And you need evidence of recent strep infection in the way of positive throat cultures, growing group A, beta hemolytic strep, or elevated anti streptococcus O titer, or anti-DNAs or anti-hyaluronidase antibodies. <sighs> What are the signs of carditis? So as we know, rheumatic fever, uh, oh dear, sorry about that. Rheumatic fever can cause carditis involving the, the entire heart. We said uh, endomyopericardium, right? So it's pancarditis. Signs of endocarditis, guys, the heart sounds are soft. <laughs> a pantostolic murmur due to mitral regurgitation. You may have the beloved catechum's murmur, which is a mid-diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis, mediated by rheumatic fever. You may have early diastolic murmur due to aortic regurgitation, which is due to valvulitis with nodules in the valve. Signs of myocarditis, the most sensitive one is arresting tachy. Arresting tachy, you must think myocarditis. Soft heart sounds in the way of, uh, uh, you also have a third uh, heart sound, an ST gallop, cardiomegaly clinically, and features of heart failure. Signs of pericarditis being a pericardial rub, and the patient usually complains of chest pain and pericardial effusion may be present. What is erythema marginatum, pray tell? It's characterized by transient raised pink or red rash which blanches on pressure with a clear center and a round margin. It occurs in about 10% of cases, mostly found on the trunk and proximal limbs, but not on the face. If it's on the face, it's not erythema marginatum. It may coalesce to form crescent or ring-shaped patch. What is a subcutaneous nodule? These are small, firm, and painless P-shaped nodules felt over body prominences and tendons or joints in extensive surfaces. It's present in about 10 to 15 percent of cases of rheumatic fever. Righty. What is Sydenham's chorea, otherwise termed St. Vitus dance? It is a neurological manifestation of acute rheumatic fever, which usually occurs after a while, after months of an acute attack, when almost all the other signs disappear. Alrighty.
And uh, we say that it's found in about one third of cases, more common in kids and adolescents, more common in females, uh, five to 15 years of age, usually associated with some other features, emotional instability, irritability, inattentiveness, confusion, may occur without any other features of acute rheumatic fever, can be a standalone feature, colitis is common and may indeed be the first manifestation, speech may be explosive and halting. So yeah, halted there. <laughs> Not a halter monitor now. <laughs> ESR, ASOT, and CRP usually normal. Relapse may occur only in a few cases, occasionally due to pregnancy, which is called chorea gravidarum, or in those taking oral contraceptive pills. Treatment is usually self-limiting, and sydenham's chorea recovers within a few months. Sedation with haloperidol, along with other treatment and prophylaxis for rheumatic fever should be given. How do we treat rheumatic fever? Everybody, number one, complete bed rest until disease activity resolves. Number two, oral phenoxymethyl penicillin, which is otherwise more affectionately termed PEN-VK, PEN-VK, 250 milligrams, six hourly for 10 days, or an alternative is a single shot of benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units in the bums to eliminate your strep infection. If the patient's allergic to penicillin, you can give them erythromycin as an alternative. Number three is analgesia. The dose is 60 milligram per kg of aspirin, Per day in divided doses, high doses may be needed. Watch out for Rye syndrome in children, which is acute um, liver failure, right, in the context of aspirin use. Number four is other treatment in the way of for cardiac failure. You give it diuretic, you give it dig if you need to. For pericarditis, consider non steroidal and steroid in selected cases. For cardiac or severe arthritis, prednisone. 1 to 2 milligram per kg daily, and then you taper thereafter for chorea, diazepam, for mild cases, haloperidol, severe cases. Number five is address and treat complications like cardiac failure, valvular lesion, heart block, arrhythmia, etc., as needed. What is prophylaxis for rheumatic fever? Recurrence is common in patients who have had colitis during the initial episode. In kids, there's a 20% recurrence which occurs within five years, so watch out! Recurrence is uncommon after five years and in patients over 25 years of age. To prevent recurrence, we give oral pen VK, which is phenoxy methyl penicillin, 250 milligram 12 hourly, or injection benzathine penicillin, 1.2 million units in the bums deep. I am monthly in penicillin allergic patients. Once more, erythromycin can be given as an alternative. The dose is 250 milligram, 12 hourly per os, or you can even use uh, clarithromycin, which is a macrolide, right? Prophylactic drugs, and this is the thing I want to mention, right? Prophylactic drugs should indeed be continued up to 21 years of age or five years after the last attack. Uh, whichever is longer. So prophylaxis should be continued up to the age of 21 years or five years after the last attack, whichever is longer because recurrence after five years is very rare. If, however, there is residual heart disease, right, like especially valvular disease, prophylaxis should be continued for 10 years or 40 years of age, whichever is longer. So if there's no residual heart disease, we continue prophylaxis up to the age of 21 years or five years after the last attack. But if there's residual heart disease, prophylaxis should be continued for 10 years or um, 40 years of age, whichever is uh, longer. If there is documented recurrence or documented rheumatic valvular disease, lifelong prophylaxis should be considered. What other signs of activity of rheumatic fever pray tell? Persistent fever, tachycardia, high erythrocyte sedimentation rate, leukocytosis, evidence of carditis. Please note the following points, everybody. That skin infection with cyprococci is not, is not, is not associated with rheumatic fever. So skin infection with strep is not associated with rheumatic fever. Strep sore throat may not be present in some cases. Upwards of 50% of cases of rheumatic fever with carditis will develop chronic valvular disease after usually 10 to 20 years. All the cardiac valves may be involved, but most commonly by and large the mitral valve. So it gives you mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, mixed mitral valve disease. Aortic valve may be involved, but it's very rare to have the right-sided valves, the tricuspid pulmonary valve coming to the party. In chronic rheumatic heart disease, there is no history of rheumatic fever in some 50 to 60 percent of cases. Arthritis in rheumatic fever is one that recovers completely without any residual change. It's a non deformative, flitting migratory polyarthritis, right? Remember the maxim, guys. We said this before and I'll say it again. Rheumatic fever licks the joints but <clears throat> bites the heart. What are the causes of migratory? Uh, polyarthritis, okay, so it's rheumatic fever. You also get it in the context of septicemia, gonococcal arthritis, syphilitic arthritis, Lyme arthritis, hyperlipidemia type 2, uh, SRE, the wolf, ow, sarcoidosis, bacterial endocarditis, and Whipple's disease. Okay, guys, here's a little picture showing uh, what 
The migratory polyarthritis may look like manifesting as an effusion in the right knee here and swelling of the knee joint in rheumatic fever here. Okay, guys, coming back to our clinical case, let's just recap a bit. Get that out of the way for now, and let's get my pointer in there. Okay, we had a young lady who comes to you since the age of four. She was diagnosed with acute rheumatic fever. She doesn't recall any specifics of the illness. She had to be on bed rest for six months. She has a main on PNVK, 250 milligrams twice a day since that time. She asks if she can discontinue the medication. She has only had one flare at the age of eight, right, when she stopped taking the penicillin. She's currently employed as a daycare provider. Uh, that's important, hey? Physical exam shows a great tear of six pants, a stonic mama, normal apex. What you want to do? Drum roll, please. Ding, 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 ding. D. She could continue penicillin indefinitely as she has had a previous recurrence, has presumed rheumatic heart disease, and is working in a field. She's a daycare center provider, right? Daycare provider. And she's working in the field with high occupational exposure to group A, beta-amyloidic steps. So recurrent episodes of rheumatic fever are the most common in the first, what, five years after the initial diagnosis, right? Penicillin prophylaxis is recommended for at least this period of five years. But after these five years, secondary prophylaxis is determined on an individual basis. Now, ongoing prophylaxis is currently recommended for patients who, number one, have had recurrent disease, number two, have rheumatic disease, number three, work in occupation. This is the key point in this case. Work in occupations that have a high risk for re-exposure to group A strep infection. Okay, my friends, today let's just talk about strength in the Lord. The book of Psalm, chapter 27, verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and what happens? He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31, Right. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. My friends, I know this life is crazy hectic. We all have different objectives, we have ambitions, we have goals, we're always trying to catch our tails. And sometimes it's easy to feel down and demotivated and weak, right? But like the Bible tells us, like how David and his men did, they strengthened themselves in the Lord. Go back, read the word, focus on the Lord Jesus, spend time in prayer, right? And, uh, you know, the the the, the the pillars of the early church in the book of Acts, Acts 2.42, was Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread and Prayer. Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread and Prayer. Go back to the basics and strengthen yourself in the Lord. Amen. Here are my references. All right. Big thank you to makecomic.com for their uh, beautiful illustrations and to Tally and to uh, Prof. Abdullah and uh, the company at Harrison's. God bless you. Have yourself a fantastic day. We're going to be talking about plural effusion soon. God bless.